So here we are, limits of functions, now metric space. Well, <clears throat> for this chapter, we'll mainly focus on real functions, complex functions, and vector value functions. But when we're introducing the definitions, we'll focus on like general settings. Well, okay, so the definition of a limit of a function is, so x, y, metric space, E is a subset of x, f math from e to y, and p is the limit point of e. Will this guarantee that every puncture neighborhood of p intersects e? So, we write fx converges to q if there exists a q in the metric space y such that no matter what tolerance you choose, there exists a delta such that when x is in the puncture neighborhood of radius delta, this gives fx maps into the epsilon neighborhood of q in metric space y. Okay. And here's an important characteristic of limits of functions using the sequences. Well, so the limit of fx at x approaches p is equal to q if and only if for any sequence in e if pn is not equal to p and it converges to p then this implies the sequence of functions converges to q well so this implies this and also this implies this so we shall prove it we start with this direction first. So this direction. Okay. So <coughs> if you just let, if you just, if you just let epsilon greater than zero, mm -hmm. so there take this delta such that whenever we just write down the definition here. Converge to Q, right? Okay. But notice this. For this delta, right, there exists a capital N such that for any M, right, the N, we have a DX of PN, P. Delta and greater than zero. Well, this is because Pn not equal to P. This is because Pn converges to P. Well, they both imply that. Right? Since these two, say these two, right? Okay. Now, for this direction. Well, we suppose for a contradiction such that f is not, does not converge to p, which means that this this we have x p delta and we have f these two statement holds right well okay construct A sequence of epsilon n such that epsilon no delta n such that delta n is equal to one over n, right? While this gives a sequence p n n e 
so d of p n uh q less than delta n right so you have a delta n such as this so this gives a p n such that this is true right because why is this true because mm, get messed up oh I think I messed up mm. so there exist X such that this In place this exists in X such that this gives this right. Okay, now we're good, right? So we vary, we let epsilon if epsilon equals one over n, right? Well, because is because f is does not converge to fx does not converge to q which means for every x n that exist x we call it pn for every corresponding de delta n so we have this is true so this gives pn well pn converges to p pn doesn't equal p and f of pn q greater equal to epsilon for any n right well this is a contradiction because we supposed to have this thing converges to p it converges to q but this is greater than epsilon right F F of P N does not cover just a Q, and we're done. And we used to corollary that limit of functions is unique. Well, this is really simple because we prove it. So if X to P of F X equals to Q. And R, then we use the above theorem, right? This implies that, these two implies that, okay, for Pn, P, Pn converges to P, right? This This gives limit of f p n equals to <coughs> q. And this gives f of p n equals to r. Right, and we know that the sequence of limits is unique. The limit of sequence. <laughs> of sequence is unique so we have q is equal to r and we're done okay <laughs> <coughs> so for this if e subset of x is a metric space p is a limit point of e and fg are complex value functions. <coughs> so 
such that the limit given, then their addition, multiplication, division <coughs> of limits holds. And also, if FG maps to RK, then A holds. While the B becomes the pro dot product version, right? So the proof, um, we think in terms of sequences, right? Then, then we're good, right? Because because if you think in terms of sequences, well, sequence, of course, satisfy these laws, right? And, right, in general, it holds. And for the dot product, um, you think of, so the dot product is to take every component and you multiply them and then you add, add all of them up. And it is of course reduced to each component and for each component right you can use the you can use this and then you use this so in general again you have this okay and we're gonna talk about continuities of functions so the definition is that okay s y metric spaces e sub x f from e to y and p is an e p must be an e so we said that f is continuous at p if and if for any epsilon greater than zero there exists a delta such that well remember before we have this is should be uh greater than zero but in continuity we don't care it's okay and we have this is true Continue should be FP. FP. Right. Well, if. Oh, yeah, we also require P is in the point of B. Well, this makes sure that, okay, every um, delta neighborhood around P intersects E, right? Well, if P is isolated point at E, then we know that there exists a neighborhood that if it intersect with E, it only outputs the singleton set P itself. While this, so matter how F is defined, and for any epsilon greater than zero, we just pick a delta. We just pick a random delta. We, we pick we pick this delta. For so for this delta we already picked such that the intersection is empty, right? And for no matter what epsilon we choose, we pick this delta. That means that this gives this. Because x is equal to p, right? Because it's it's empty, it's empty, right? Okay, that's enough for remarks. And go move on. Well, usually, on a textbook, people denotes or people define continuity as follows: like, if f continuous as p, f and only if f x as x converges p is equal to f p. Well, this is a theorem. Why? For this direction, right, f is continuous at p, then, well, yeah, trivial. Just followed by the definition. And for this direction, we know that, okay, so, 
if it's continuous at if it if it converges to FP then if it converges to FP exists delta such that this gives this if it converges to FP then it gives then we, if it converges to FP, then we know this statement holds, right? This whole thing holds. But while even, even when this thing is equal to zero, this still holds because this also equals to zero, less than epsilon, right? So trivial, really trivial. So easy. It's followed by the definition. Okay, so then we move on. We say that the so f is continuous at a point, g is continuous at that point, then g of f is also continuous. Well, let's prove this theorem. Nah. Okay. So for this theorem, well, for epsilon greater than zero, right? We know G is continuous at what? FP. G is continuous at FP, which means that there exists a neta greater than zero, such that the distance of GY, GF, FP, this whole thing, if, if we have um, Y and FP, right? Y and FP less than Nita. And for Nita greater than zero, Again, for this neta, then it goes zero since y is an fe, right? Since y is an fe, and we use f is continuous. So there is delta greater than zero, such that this holds. Like, like, um. If we have x and um, p, fx and fp, right? If x and p is less than delta. We use the fact that f is continuous, right? So if we combine, well, if we combine this, this shows that epsilon greater than zero exists delta zero such that this gives um, this gives all the way up to this, right? Well, this is basically um, G is continuous at P, right? And now H continuous at P. And we're done with this one. Because G of Y G of y is equal to h of x, and this is equal to h of p, right? xp, hx, hp, because y is equal to fx, right? Okay, well, here is an important theorem about continuity. Well, okay, 
So f x to y is continuous. That means for e open of y f, the inverse matrix, the the, the preimage of v is open in x. Okay. So to prove this, we go with this theorem, not this direction first. <coughs> so f continuous on x, v open, and y. Well, in topology, we define continuous in this way. But in analysis, we define it a little bit different. But ultimately, they're they're almost they're like the same, right? So v open y want to show that the in uh, pre image of v under f is open in x. That's what we want to show for this direction. Okay, so we let p is in x. We let p is in x, so we know that f p is in v, or p is in pre image of v, right? Okay, so V is open. That means that there exists epsilon such that such that the neighborhood around FP this point is a subset of V. While F is continuous at P. F is continuous at P which means that there exists delta such that the x of x and p less than delta gives this gives um, f of x is in the neighborhood epsilon neighborhood of fp right because for this epsilon, right, there is a delta because it's continuous at p, right? Okay, now, well, if we translate it, this means that x is in the delta neighborhood of p implies um, if fx, if fx is in this set, well, this is basically this, and which means that fx is in v. fx is in v, which means that the pre fx. This means that this means that x x is in the preimage of v under f. Right. Well, this means that. The subset of V. Well, look. Well, look for for any P in this. There exists a neighborhood, right? So we're good. And uh, for this direction, this way. Well, we, we fix. So we fix a P and X first. Fix the point in X. So we let let v equals to some neighborhood of f of p, where f sounds greater than zero, right? As v is subset of y, right? But we know that v is open. By our hypothesis, this is open. Right. Well, because this is open because neighborhoods are open, right? And by our hypothesis, f of negative v is open, while f p is in f p is in v. Right, which means that. This shows f p is in v, so this gives that p is in pre image of v. Again, then there exists a neighborhood, right? And delta p 
S M F F O E V. Fuck. Or. Um, this means that well, f x is in this. This means that x is in this. Well, this again means that this gives right. This means fx is in v, right? So it means fx, fx is in this, right? Just translation. Well, this means that f is continuous at p. Why? Because f square and zero is given such that this implies this, which is precisely this. All right. Well, if f, g are continuous complex function, then their addition, their multiplication, their division are all continuous. Well, for this one, we can, we can, u we can use the limit we use the sequence characterization of functions. We use this, right? Use this sequence, also arithmetic, arithmetic laws of limbs of sequences, right? Well, then that becomes trivial. Because for, for sequences, right, their addition, multiplication, their division, all holds. Well, this, obviously, this, this, uh, this requires g. I mean, g is not zero. The function is not zero mapping at the point. Um, the limit of g is not zero, and uh, yeah, g x is not zero, because if g is zero, then we have a problem, right? Okay. So it's lazy. Okay, so this one, our last one. So. F, f1 to fk are real value functions and we define a function to rk to be like this well part a means f is continuous means each coordinate is continuous and b means that okay then the addition and the dot product is continuous and we prove it So, um, for part A, for part A, what the hell? For part A, we use this inequality. We use this formula. So, this is less than equal. Uh, maybe I should write it smaller. So, so we know that, well, if j of y minus this is less than or equal to the whole thing, right? And well, this is equal to right 
right? And you take a sum and the whole thing, square root, right? We'll solve for this and we prove this direction. Well, if the whole thing is con continuous, then each coordinate is continuous. Well, well, right. Oops. For this direction, for this direction, we just we just let epsilon greater than zero. And we can let each coordinate is less than epsilon root k. Well, this turn out to say that uh, this turn to say that fx. Less than epsilon. Well, of course, for each coordinate that exists, like delta 1, delta 2, to delta k, let delta, and then we let delta less than equal to the minimum, right? So we have epsilon, delta, boom, we're done, right? And for part b, for B, well, F plus G is equal to F1 plus G1, FK plus GK, right? Wow. Well, because each of this is continuous, which means that each of this, all of them, are continuous and also all of them are continuous again gives this is continuous and I thought G is equal to F is equal to F1 G1 plus plus F K G K right while these two are continuous in place that all of them are continuous. And all for all of them are continuous, that means all of them are continuous. And you add up, all of them are continuous. And since this is equal to this, this continuous means this is continuous. Done.